This is episode 71 of the Immunology Podcast, The Neuroscience of HIV with Dr. Diana Williams. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Jason Goldsmith and Dr. Brenda Roud. Welcome back to the Immunology Podcast, where we have conversations with immunologists. The Immunology Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. If you enjoy the Immunology Podcast, rate us and leave a review. We're always looking for feedback on how the podcast can be improved and for suggestions on guests. Today, we have Dr. Diana Williams from Emory University on the podcast to talk about her research on the neuropathogenesis of HID. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in immunology news coming up. But first... Are you planning to attend Immunology 2024 in Chicago, Illinois on May 3rd to 7th? Make sure your hotel reservations are ready before April 10, 2024 to take advantage of special rates for attendees. Visit immunology2024.aai.org for more information. All right. Well, we got a few months until Chicago. Yeah, well, they come faster than you than you think. Uh, I mean, I, I would like a little time between now and May. I, I'm comfortable with that notion. <laughs> Me too, because my birthday is in May, and I don't want to have any of those anymore. Are you, are you going to be at AAI for your birthday? No, not this time. Last year was the case, but now they moved it a week earlier. Uh, so it wouldn't, I think, because people were not very happy that it always coincided with Mother's Day in the U.S. So they moved it up a week. Uh, alas, but we can still celebrate your birthday there. I mean, you're happy. You're welcome to. I wouldn't mind. Do a giant cake shaped like a T-cell. That would be awesome. Or those little mini pops, you know, like those little, uh, you know, uh, cake on a stick things that are circular get cake pops but make the cake pop look like a t-cell that's that's kind of cool i mean stem cells should be doing that for the you know the customer appreciation dinner like we had last year they should be offering that as a so just take note but well you know 24 goes goes very quickly in any case it's starting to i mean at least we're in the first month but we're finally done with all the snow that we got so yeah. Well, we have record wind here. It's every day so windy. And we yesterday we were at the movies with my boyfriend and we actually had a power power outage because of the of the storm while uh, we were we couldn't even watch the movie at all. Did they refund your ticket at least? Yes. Yes. Well, that was very I'm very strange because then we needed to leave the parking lot and you know it's like how are we going to supposed to take our car out of here? <laughs> so it was it was chaos. People are not used to. Your infrastructure here is pretty solid. So uh, how was, did uh, what movie were you going to? It's just that uh, the independent uh, 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 film called um, Los Colonos is about uh, is the end of the century uh, Chilean uh, and how people you know moved in there to basically graze cattle and it was like the Wild West. It was a Wild South. So that, that definitely is an independent film. <laughs> I don't know. I will tell you how it was, but I don't know. We didn't get to see. <laughs> you only saw the first. The first scene was literally a guy got getting shot because he got so injured that he couldn't work anymore. So the guy was like, "Well, you're done." That was as much as we got to see. So <laughs> oh, I don't know. Terrible. I don't know. All but right. Well, well, to the papers and the papers, you know. Things that are much less brief than uh, your movie experience is things like long COVID. There you go. So, so we have a paper called Persistent Complement Dysregulations with Signs of Thromboinflammation in Active Long COVID. Uh, first author is Carlos Servia Hasler, and last author is Honor Boyman. So to really sum this up, it was came out in January 19th. They started, they, they took a good cohort of patients and had blood samples from patients who were either not infected, known to be infected, and known to be infected who went on to report long COVID symptoms. And they show a whole bunch of different things that are all the same thing in the end, which kind of lets us be easy to summarize. Uh, it was 39 healthy controls, 113 COVID patients to start with, that they show differences in complement levels. And so the complement complexes are decreased in people with long COVID, but the precursors are increased. And if we know with complement, right, with all cell lysis, like you're going to consume the complexes if you have active complement and inflammation, but you're going to have more of the precursors. And so they threw a series of blood tests using these uh, small molecules that can be used to uh, basically target an ELISA type process. So it's a serum proteome mechanism. To evaluate, they were able to uh, 
determine that, hey, compliments being consumed. And then they went and deep dive this and were able to map out multiple compliment pathways being disrupted. Uh, C7 being a big marker here, but the downstream complex is also being disrupted. And then they went in and also thought, found that there was some thromboinflammation with the fibrinogen pathways. Remember, complement can also act, activate clotting. And so that showed that that was disrupted too. It really showed that it persisted all the way out. Um, and so they said classic and alternative complement activation. They kind, they kind of did the whole thing. So it was pretty, pretty well done in terms of mapping out the pathway. The paper basically just breaks down every step of complement and goes through the whole thing. They use a variety of mechanisms like mass spec. They do a little bit of RNA-seq on cells to demonstrate that they're seeing genetic modifications that align with what they see by, by protein. They show that some of this inflammation is associated with viral reactivation of herpes viruses, which is a known thing in COVID as well. They try to link some mechanism maybe to that, but I, I wasn't really convinced. They have some von Willebrand's factor going up. So they, they show that like in a separate cohort with this Mount Sinai cohort, they can recapitulate this as well. Uh, so they do a pretty good job walking through everything. And then again, the, this protein thing is called SomaScan, which uses these small aptamers that you can dry, that, that if they bind to various parts of proteins, can tell you that that, that is in the serum at some quantity. And so, you know, I think they did a good job establishing that people with long-term effects are having chronic inflammation that is complement mediated. I don't know if it's, they don't really show that this is unique to COVID though, right? So they show this happens with COVID, but I still wonder if people who have long COVID, if people also have long flu and long all types of things with infection, that's why people sometimes develop persistent inflammatory symptoms or feel icky for six months or a year or whatever. But when you have a pandemic, you kind of have a start point for a whole bunch of people and everyone paying attention. And so you notice things that are actually more common in biology than people realize. Yeah. Yeah, I had heard of that that when you think about it, also flu can also linger, the, the symptoms can linger very long. And I we hadn't really paid that much attention to it, but now it became very quite evident uh because of the pandemic. Yeah, I mean it's it's a hypothesis I have, at least. Okay. They did a good job mapping it out and answered a question people were asking. Or I mean Whatever helps understand uh, long COVID, I think is especially now with so many people that are, you know, clearly have developed it, uh, it could be a sor major source of, of disability or, you know, there's, we need to find the reasons for, for long COVID and hopefully how to treat it. All right. Um, also talking about how, how, can, how can I segue this? Mm. Also talking about your immune system getting the best of you or working against you. Uh, this first article I want to talk about um, is shows a kind of a causal um, a causal relationship between T cell autoreactive T cells and a particularly a particular uh, a nervous system disorder called Guillaume Barre. Uh, which is this uh, disease that affects the peripheral nervous system and um, usually has kind of an acute, and then most people, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, eventually recover. Uh, but during this time, uh, it generates uh, muscle weakness, lo lo uh, loss of reflexes, uh, and uh, if you're unlucky enough, uh, respiratory failures or autonomic dysfunction, and that can lead, you know, it can be lethal eventually. But most people seem to kind of resolve this eventually. And so the paper is called Autoreactive T-cells Target Peripheral Nerves in Guillain uh, Baron Syndrome. And it was published in Nature uh, in uh, the 17th of, of January. And first authors are Lenka Suke, Suke Nikova and Anne Malone from the lab of Daniela Latore at the ETH Institute in Zurich. Uh, and so Basically, I guess the, the, the motivation for this study is uh, this is clearly an inflammatory disease. It is affecting nerves. So, so are T cells involved here? And this is not unheard of. Uh, uh, so of course, no autoimmune disorders are very, uh, come in different, many flavors. 
in the case of this uh, uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome, they are different subtypes. And here, I just want to highlight that there's one that is called acute polyinflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, or AIDP, which is the most common and in which you basically observe uh, injury at the myelin sheaths and Schwann cell components of you know, of the of the nerves. Uh, and then there's a different one uh, called uh, acute mo motor axonal neuropathy, um, and which affects uh, the membranes of the axons of nerve of of the, the nerves uh, on the nodes of Rambier, which is, if I understand correctly, is a space in between the Schwann cells, like the little gap, so it actually goes directly to the uh, uh, neurons themselves. So I just want to make this point because they show that the etiologies of these two diseases, although they're both kind of, um, they're both included in the Guillain-Barré syndrome, they're clearly of different uh, origin. And they also see that in one case, T-cells matter and the other ones, they, they, don't, they don't see evidence for that. So well, they, they look into uh, samples from patients that are having this disorder uh, in different stages. Patients have, you know, they're having like an acute uh, manifestation, they are they having chronic syndrome, they are recovering. So they have the, they look at samples in different circumstances. And basically what they see is that they can find if they take cells from the blood from these patients and they culture them together with a uh, selection of, of proteins that are derived from these neurons and this um, uh, uh, nerve uh, material, Basically, they can see that they are cells that are, in fact, proliferating as a consequence of this co-culture with these peptides. They also use uh, viral, viral peptides as a, as a control because most of us, all the, most of the time, if you co-culture thesis from basically anybody with EBV or uh, influenza or CMV peptides, there will, there will be memory cells there that are... Um, that are proliferating. So they also did kind of pre-select the memory populations and that increases the sensitivity of this assay. And they show that uh, there's basically this uh, a PNS myelin antigen, which are the main target, the main uh, proteins that are uh, generating this proliferation of T-cells, uh, particularly this P0, P2, uh, and P and P22, which are like different, uh, different ones. And... Uh, they show, and while well, and P this P21 seems to be the most immunodominant, this one that has the most hits in most of the patients. Uh, they find mostly CD4 cells that are proliferating. They also see some CD8s, but clearly this is mostly a CD4 uh, uh, preferential uh, phenomena. And they they kind of this they select these cells and they look into their uh, uh, RNA-seq, their transcriptome, and their TCR repertoire, and they kind of characterize and to understand what are these cells doing there. They see that. Uh, within their self-reactive uh, uh, cells, uh, there is this kind of Th1 phenotype that it has also been associated with other, other types of autoimmunity when they look at their transcriptomic signature. Uh, they look into uh, single clones, and they show that indeed they are recognizing these uh, PNS myelin re uh, 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 derived peptides, and they go through some extent, uh, some work, uh, characterizing the different T-cell clones, looking into relationships between the clone, how they cluster, and they show that uh, which are the peptides that are mostly recognized, and they see which are the clusters of TCRs that are according to their sequence, they're most kind of most likely to be recognizing similar structures, and they do a whole analysis. I think it's very interesting. One of the things that I want to highlight, which is pretty, pretty cool, is that when it comes to the the complementary determined regions, the CDR uh, uh, regions, the most important CDR3 in the beta chain of the TCRs, uh, they, these are the ones that guide most of the specificity of a TCR. These are uh, kind of an average or in general shorter than the CDR3 beta regions of other T cells that are recognizing other entities such as viruses or, or things that the T cells are actually supposed to recognize. And this seems to be a pattern in autoimmune. Uh, or self-reactive TCR. So that's the thing that's very interesting. And they, they see this across patients. So shorter CDR3 beta uh, sequences. Um, also interesting, uh, when, when people are trying to understand, you know, why are these antigens being, being recognized? Uh, there's something about, you know, are these particular HLA alleles that are better at presenting this peptide? It doesn't seem to be the case. And also this does not 
correlate with any epidemiological kind of correlation with a particular uh, HLA allele, and this is what they see as well, fairly fairly variable. Um, so I think they make a really strong case showing that for this AIDP uh, variant of uh, uh, Guillain-Barre, uh, that they seem to be really guided by CD4 recognition with a specific uh, proteins and some peptides that are dominant they're the most commonly recognized, um, and this these T cells have a kind of auto uh, Th1 uh, phenotype associated with autoimmunity. Also, things interesting in some of the cases, often these uh, these Guillain-Barré uh, syndromes are triggered by some infection or some uh, immunological event, uh, and so in some cases when it was seemed to have been triggered by CMV, so they have patients that. Uh, a primary CMV infection trigger the 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 the, the disease. Uh, there, they have found T cells that are reactive against both CMV and uh, peptides derived from these P uh, from these uh, proteins, uh, these self uh, proteins. So I think that's also very interesting that you can see some kind of maybe some triggering by these infections. Um, so yeah, in the end, you know, it's it's, it's nice to know this the word this disease is it's, it helps understand how the disease uh, comes around, um, and it shows how much T cells can mess things up if they're not kept in check. But you love T cells, Brenda. I love them. They're complicated characters. You know, they're not gray, They're not black and white. They're full of gray areas, and that's why you know I respect them. Do you love their ambiguity? I know. That's life. Life is ambiguous, Jason. That's how it is. Just want a good guy. <laughs> yeah, but this this shows how important it is to have T-Rex because this you cannot avoid having this self-reactive T-cells. And this is where T-Rex play a role in, you know, keeping these things from happening. And this is where they fail. But but that's why we not all of us have uh, Guillain-Barre. Uh, it's just selective, selected people that have it. That's true. I've seen it before in clinic. It's quite an interesting manifestation. Yeah. Well, what, what do you see? Like, how do the patients? They have ascending flaccid paralysis. Mm. Flaccid paralysis, rather. So they stop breathing. Yeah. And and do they, is, is is it true that they mostly recover? Is it how long does it take? Yeah. Uh, they can recover in days to weeks to months. And what's the treatment? You should steroids. Have. Steroids, right? Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, so usually it starts in the feet and works its way up, but sometimes uh, it can start in the face and work its way down, and oh that's bad because then it hits your lungs. Yeah, yeah. but most people can recover from it. I can see the problem. Okay, so what else do you have? All right. Well, I got some. Uh, you know, I know you love car T's, but I'm going to talk about car and K's. Oh, no, they're good too. Shoot me. What, what, what's, what's new with car and case? So in nature medicine, safety, efficacy, and determinants of response of allergenic CD19 specific car and K cells in CD19 positive B cell tumors, a phase one, two trial. First author, David Marin. Last author, K. Katayun Rezvani. So long story short, nature medicine came out 18th January. They did car and K cell. So that expressing an anti-CD19 chimeric antigen receptor and IL-15, because IL-15 stabilizes NK cells. Long story, it works well in B cell malignancies, but they really parsed out responders and non-responders. And they derive this NK cells from cord blood. It's not autologous. They take cord blood donors. And if you don't know cord blood, that comes from, you know, uh, birth, you know, the, uh, the placental cord, umbilical cord. And so they take that and turn it into these CAR and Ks. And so part of the paper says, hey, this looks good. And we have a responder and non-responder population. The response is pretty impressive here. They're seeing uh, overall survival and progression free were 68% uh, and 32% at days 30 and 100. Uh, they had higher overall response in a subgroup of people, but, but there was a definite strong clinical effect. Obviously, it's 37 patients, not a high enough end to really fully validate it. 
But they actually then looked and tried to see if they could figure out what caused the differences in response. And that's where this is super cool and got me super excited is they looked at the donor. Now, being a donor drive product person myself, I got very excited by this. They found that nucleated blood cells was bad. That's a sign of stress response. And, you know, so low nucleated blood cells and a quick collection of cryopreservation time of less than 24 hours was greatly indicative of success. And they could put this in a training set and find the same thing if they do like machine learning to predict this as well. And what they find is that they find that there's these stress markers, so nucleated blood cells are a stress response, right? And there's markers of increased inflammation, hypoxia, cell stress responses. They could recapitulate this. So they took cells and did it in mouse models or in the p- Petri dish and looked at the cell performance of, you know, these earlier, you know, wait 24 hours or more, stress the cells out and then measure. And they could see and recapitulate the differential responses in vitro and in vivo, not in people with this. And they also looked at other people's NK trials and found that when they use core blood as well, that they saw the same correlation. So that's what's really cool here. And then and they, and they then they chased down in multiple mouse models the mechanism in terms of reestablishing that, yeah, these stress response cells, they start working fine, but they exhaust early essentially and stop functioning as well and kind of poop out. So they have an initial f- effect that's just fine, but they just can't maintain it. And then if you're familiar with trogocytosis, which is where the ant- target antigen goes from the tumor to the car effector cells, and so the car cells kill each other, that happens more in these stressed out cells as well. So that's where I, I was really excited by this paper is they really were able to, you know, trying to get away from autologous transfer, right, which is expensive and takes a lot of time. But you could just take cord blood and crank this out over and over and over again. That's great. But now they're figuring out what cord blood is better and doing it in a really meaningful manner with metrics that you can easily measure nucleated blood cells, time to cryopreservation. You can, you can do clinical medicine and have easy clinical tests to assess that or just a stopwatch, right? And then get it done and then create these products. So I was very excited to see this and that they see a drastic difference based on this. So they say significantly correlated, but something like multi it's like 90% of their response or something is in the group that has the positive markers and the other group barely doesn't respond at all or as much worse. And so that's where they see the bifurcation in responders and non-responders is almost completely on these axes. It's not like a minor contribution of a little bit. They use some Bayesian models, but it's wildly contributive. Uh, I don't think, I'm not surprised. I'm glad that they have the numbers um, because that's, it has to to matter uh, how, how you process, how you handle the cells after the uh, getting them out of the, the tissue. It's, it's great that there's some some number. And I wonder whether this also applies to T-cell products, uh, just regular T-cell products. If it's all, if you get an apheresis, is, you know, how long the apheresis was or how the conditions of the apheresis was that might also uh, have to do. Because what I think for the nucleated cell, because this is, if it's core blood, what kind of things affects the amount of nucleated cells that you see? I don't think we know that well, the stress mm. response probably of the patient. Mm, yeah. Right. So that'd be where I would go. Okay. Yeah. Well, I also, I think it's really cool. The, the NK, the NK car NK cells are very interesting. Um, I really want to wonder how they, how they will progress in the clinic. Uh, and the fact that you can, you know, get uh, a lot from a, uh, cord blood or things like that and then you can really treat many patients with the same that's that's very promising for sure and i'm really excited to see where this goes i just i think it's good medicine in this case they really were able to get get at something important and did they sorry do they, how do they work so do they what is the did those patients that got infused did they uh the, the was a c19 car what kind of car was it yeah, it was a c19 car with il15 as well to kind of keep them going Ah, okay. Okay. How are, they, are those the, the trucks, the ones that are? They didn't get into those details here that I could pull up, but like there's these, the, these IL-15 positive anti-CD-19 cars. 
The dial 15 mm -hmm. helps keep the NK cells uh, moving along. This was done at MD Anderson. Okay. All right. So one more for you, Brenda. Oh, one more for me. So for uh, finishing this conversation today, uh, talking about, you know, cell therapy, and I have, I, I have to admit, I have a soft spot for technology papers about cell therapy <laughs> for obvious personal reasons. Uh, and so the, the paper uh, I want to talk now about uh, is called In Vivo Human T-Cell Engineering with Enveloped Delivery Vehicles. And I think it's very nice because, um, yeah, it's, you know, advances in how we make uh, genetically engineered T-cells and they have so many, they're such a promising uh, function. So I think it's always very interesting. And this paper uh, comes from the lab of Jennifer Doudna, uh, the, the the woman herself, first author Jennifer Hamilton from some, from the Jennifers, uh, and uh, was published in Nature on the 10th of uh, January. And uh, basically they show a new way of make uh, a new delivery method that could allow us to make CAR T cell or edit cells in vivo. So in they do, uh, they study how it would work with these cells, but in principle, you, you know, you could apply this for other types of cells, like, I don't know, uh, stem cells or, or other kind, whatever. If you, as long as you can find the surface molecule uh, that characterizes it, you, you can target it. So um, as always, making genetically engineered T cells, it's, you know, it's not that easy. Um, and a big part of, especially if you're delivering things like Cas9, uh, or if you want to deliver, you know, some antiviral uh, contents, you know, they, they, getting them into the cell is always difficult. And in the case of Cas9, uh, you can either, you know, trans transduce the virus that expresses the Cas9 and the guide RNA and then the whole uh, shebang within the virus. But in the case of T cells, this doesn't seem to work that well. So in the case of T cells, the most popular way of editing T cells with Cas9 is using the RNPs directly. So these ribonuclear proteins that that uh, that include both the Cas9 or the other Cas proteins, Cas12 or uh, whatever you you're working with, already preloaded with the guide RNA, and then you have to introduce that into the cell. That's the, this is the tricky part. So what most people do, what I do, and you know, so far is became became a little bit of the standard is electroporation. So. And so you just, you know, zap the cells with some electrical potential and under certain magical conditions. And then uh, you get these molecules to enter the cells and you use nuclear localization signals that are added to Cas9 because Cas9 is a, pro is a protein from a prokaryote. So um, they don't have a nucleus, but then you need, so if you add a nu nuclear localization signal that sends the Cas9 to the nucleus, to your DNA, and you get your gene editing. So... In this, in this case, they are looking at different ways of delivering the Cas9 into a cell. And they look into uh, what they call kind of, you know, enveloped delivery vehicle. So viruses, and this is derived, of course, from a virus uh, prototype, uh, viruses like adenoviral vectors or adenoviruses, they are protein, they're non-enveloped viruses, and they're great, and they're used a lot to introduce things to cells, but the problem is that there's capsids, you know, the, the, that certain, that gives the virus their shape. It's, there, it's hard to add stuff or to change the tropism of these capsids. People do it, there are papers about it, but it's not easy, and it's, it's, not, it's not guaranteed that you will be able to direct this capsid against anything. But when you have enveloped viruses, they basically have a little bit of, a bit of a membrane that they take from the, the, the cell that produces the virus. And then in principle, you can add stuff to those membranes that give tropism to a virus. Uh, a very popular prototype virus for this is V. So it's kind of a, with with an with a, uh, envelope protein is this VSV. Uh, envelope protein is VSV glycoprotein that has been used for kind of wide tropism, it basically infects, uh, binds to the LDL receptor that's present in the most cells. So it just like can sh shuttle your contents anywhere in, in principle. But you don't want that. You want to direct it. You want to be able to in vivo inject this vehicle and then get it to find the right cell. So what they do is they say, well, if I have a vector in which 
I include uh, molecules that go to the surface uh, and I have some kind of antibody, uh, you know, single chain uh, 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 fragment. Um, what about that? So they that's basically what they do. They uh, start with a CD19, uh, anti-CD19, kind of the 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 the, ex, the uh, out, outside part of a car. So the CD19 antibody uh, plus the CD8 stock, which is very very common uh, as a, a building block for cars, and uh, so chimeric antigen receptors. And they show that if they make a, a vector that has that plus the the uh, sequence of a Cas9 plus the expression vector for plus the ex expression sequence for the the guide against a they, they choose beta two M as a gene of of to make the point, and they show that if they make this virus these particles this envelope delivery vehicles they're not really viruses anymore they like they just they just you know completely uh, remixed um, uh, molecules, and they can actually show that they can knock out beta 2 m on target cells that are just co-cultured their culture and they this 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 viral these uh, vehicles are added and then those find the cd19 because these this these are cells expressing cd19 on their surface so the cd19 positive cells allow the entry of this of this vehicle and this results in gene editing uh, and if you have in the same dish cells that are non cd19 positive those guys don't get edited so pretty good, pretty interesting. Efficiencies are not the greatest, but clearly it works to some extent. So they basically, with this system, they show that they can target different molecules. So they, they, they all the initial experiments are on just hex cells that are expressing you know, the molecules they want to target. They show that they can do it with CD4, with CD3, with CD... Uh, uh, they tried CD45, but that didn't work so well. Um, and they show that by tweaking a little bit, the components of that of the assembly of the virus by changing you know, the nuclear localization signal, nuclear exportals, is a little bit of, of engineering of the vectors themselves. They show that they can really assemble RNPs that are you know loaded with a guide inside a pro a particle that looks like a VSV virus. And um they they move on to T cells and they show that they they can really by using particles that are targeting CD3. CD28 and may and also sometimes CD4, they can very specifically target T cells, CD4 T cells in particular, and they can because of the CD3 and CD28, they can even mediate activation of the cells all in one thing, all in one step, um, kind kind of replacing the need to use beads. So they can they can activate cells uh, using these particles themselves. So both for tropism and for activation of the of the naive T cells. Uh, so they do this, show this in, vit in vitro, and then the the final experiment is they they inject these vectors to humanized mice, and they have a package that has an antiviral encoded CD19 car, uh, and uh, and that is packaged together with an RNP uh, that is targeting track, so the endogenous TCR alpha uh, uh, gene. And they show that they can not do the greatest efficiency, you know, it's, I think it's fairly modest still, but that's only expected. Uh, they can generate car transduce cells, so they use do use a lentiviral integration, so that doesn't change. But at the same time, some of those cells that have the lentiviral uh, construct and, and are expressing the car, they're also knockout for the endogenous alpha chain. And all of this without having to remove the cells from the humanized mice just injecting these particles. Uh, and that would be very interesting because that would mean uh, a massive reduction in the complexity and the cost of, of treating people with car TC. If you could say, well, you just get an injection, your own cells, uh, even if it's just a small amount of your own cells become car positive, uh, you can do it more than once. You can, so I, I think it's very promising. So of course, there's a lot of optimization to be done. We also want to target CD34 positive cells and the bone marrow. So that's like other alternatives. Uh, but I think in general, it's very, it's very cool. And I love all the engineering part, you know, finding the right, the right combination of, of elements. Yep. Well, it's exciting to see second generation type technologies coming along to get there. Cause we know that we can't maintain the, the pace with CAR-T long-term as it stands. Yeah. 
we've got to figure out more efficient ways. Yeah. I think the in vivo production is very interesting. Um, I don't think we're going to be doing that anytime soon. But, you know, if they become good enough, we might have a change in paradigm when it comes to cell therapies. But soon enough. And, you know, keeping things efficient, we are going to be talking to Dr. Diana Williams at Emory in just a moment. But before we get to that, scientists helping scientists is what drives innovation and advances. And it's why stem cell technologies launched the stem cell science news program 25 years ago. Sign up for free weekly newsletters at stemcellsciencenews.com to keep current with the latest cell biology research and join the celebration. Also sounds pretty efficient too. For the second part of our show today, we are very happy to be joined by uh, Dr. Diana Williams. She is associate professor at Emory University at the Department of Pharmacology and Chemical Biology. Uh, and which she recently joined. So we're also happy to discuss her recent career move. And her lab uh, and, and her interests uh, focus around neuropathogenesis of HIV uh, and also uh, uh, drug addiction behavior and how uh, these affect uh, behavior and, 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 and the central nervous system. So thank you so much for joining us today, uh, Dr. Williams. Um, welcome to the Immunology Podcast. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for being here. So I can start a little bit. Um, so I, I came from uh, UNC for a while, which had a big HIV center. And one of the things I learned in medical school was just how profound of a permanent effect HIV infection has on people, even when well controlled. So obviously, like if you're not on medication, put that aside, but even people on medications have long, long lasting effects that we're just starting to understand. And so I was wondering if you could like summarize that, where you're really pushing the field in this area, what, what, what we're seeing in science land these days on that. Yeah, Jason, you're completely correct. And honestly, that's one of the big reasons why I got into HIV research. Um, people are well treated with therapies now. They have lifespans that are very close to people without HIV. Um, they can appear relatively healthy otherwise, but you have long-term kind of comorbidities and conditions that make challenges to live your daily life, which is another reason why you got into HIV thinking about the brain specifically. So you can't cure HIV. We have great medications to keep it in check, but there's no way to cure it. And so different parts of your body are going to have different consequences, mostly due to immune perturbations, because you can have immune activation that's never really um, resolved with medication. And we also have virus that can stay in a latent state that we also can never eradicate. And so that's kind of where my research comes into play, thinking about some of these org organs that are particularly vulnerable, like the brain, with the ultimate goal of trying to find better ways to get therapies there, either it being existing therapies, or maybe we can try to find new therapies in time too. And then thinking about special populations of people, like those with substance use disorders that also um, are understudied, but are really important in the HIV uh, epidemic. So... Going a little bit into the details, so you have some work done on the kind of neuropsychiatric complications. I really, well, what Jason mentioned, I was new to me. So what kind of, of you did a study in, in women in particular, but I guess this applies for all HIV patients. What kind of uh, di disorders do you observe and how do you think those are related to immune activation? Yeah, the neuropsychiatric complications are really interesting. So on average as a whole, they can impact about half the people that have HIV. And this could include things like depression, um, an exacerbation of PTSD or stress symptoms, um, apathy. And the challenge is we don't know how to predict who's going to have these complications. And it's also challenging because the population of people with HIV is very diverse. And so when you look at cohort studies, some cohorts will have low rates of depression or cognitive um, perturbations like memory challenges, let's say. 
other cohorts will have much higher rates of these. And so it's hard for us to pinpoint exactly why this is happening. But what is very clear across the board is that there is inflammation that persists. There's a spectrum and some people it's very minimal and some people it's much higher. Um, but it's very clear that even when people are taking um, HIV therapies, inflammation is what's kind of persisting and leading to this complications, be it with cognition, other neuropsychiatric modalities. And so we're trying to find ways to either help HIV therapies get into the brain more efficiently to help reduce that inflammation, or maybe we need to find alternative therapies like adjunctive anti-inflammatories to see if that could help as well. And as of now, we haven't found anything, but we're still on the hunt. Do we know what causes the difference in different people? Are there genetic studies or GWAS or anything that's giving a clues to why people are so different? Yeah, we have lots of ideas and they're all really interesting. Some of them have to do with this concept of cognitive reserve or cognitive load, which is just each person's inherent predisposition. Think about the cold or even COVID, right? Some people get a virus, they're sick for a day or two, perfectly fine after. Some people get COVID and they have very severe symptoms and they resolve. Some people have minor symptoms and they get long COVID. It's the same kind of inherent variability that we think is a big player, but it's also clear that there are protective measures like level of education and also a lot of socioeconomic things like access to healthy foods, um, poverty growing up, trauma growing up, all of those things impact your brain, um, substance use, and all of those can make you more or less vulnerable to cognitive or other declines. And so we're trying to look at these human measures that are really variable um, in addition to genetics. So, you know, talking a little bit more technical, so I know we're this, we are talking to immunologists in the podcast. What kind of markers, what kind of populations are present maybe in the brain or which tissues are you looking at to, to see this inflammation? Yeah, so the biggest players are myeloid cells. So in the brain, that's microglia, of course, the resident brain macrophage, but we also have other brain macrophage populations that are existing, like um, perivascular macrophages at the blood-brain barrier um, that also are vulnerable to HIV and play a big role. We also see astrocytes producing a lot of cytokines and chemokines as well. Um, so you can look at people's CSF, their cerebral spinal fluid, or even in their plasma, and you'll find very classic cytokines increase with HIV. You can think of your favorites that are general, like CRP, um, but you can also think of things like TNF, IL-6, IL-1 beta. Those are all increased when you have HIV, and they remain increased to some extent, even with suppressive therapies. So mm -hmm. it's very clear there is immune perturbations, and we're trying to find ways to hopefully reduce them to some extent. What is HIV doing in the myeloid cells, especially if it infects T cells? Yeah, it's a great question. So people don't really think much about this, but HIV loves to infect myeloid cells, happily infects them. We've known this from the very beginning of HIV in the 1980s. You can look at the old papers and you will find virally infected microglia, macrophages, in spleen, lymph nodes, brain. They're infected. And the really interesting thing about them, unlike T cells, they don't die when they're infected. So they just persist and they're very long lived cells. So they're a reservoir that just hangs out waiting to produce more virus. So they're really important, though understudied. And I think they're understudied in part because it's hard to access them. You can't get brain when people are alive and even tissue biopsies, right? It's really hard to get out macrophages. T cells are much easier to get out of tissues. Macrophages have many different markers and those markers differ um, between mice, let's say, and humans. And so it's hard to study them. But when you do, it's very clear they're infected. They're an important reservoir. And at least for CNS complications, they're the major culprit contributing. I I did not know that. That's very interesting. Do they also use the same receptor? Is CCR5 also expressed on, on, on myeloid cells? Yeah. In fact, CCR5 is higher on myeloid cells than on T cells. And so in general, T cells can get infected by CCR5 viruses, but as a whole, they prefer CXCR4 tropic viruses. Um, the big difference is that T cells have much higher CD4 levels than myeloid cells. 
Um, and so that's the biggest difference in, in their infectivity. But they get infected, highly infected. And you can find it. There's tons of papers out there. Uh, people just sometimes tend to forget that they're there. It makes sense. Like, yeah, if they're, if they're still don't die, they're there doing stuff. Uh with with this whatever kind of stimuli this this virus is producing yeah so is the inflammatory consequences in the myeloid cells just because hey i'm infected and i'm hanging around here and i have an infection and it's a retrovirus and it sucks i can't get rid of it help me help me help me help me or is it the virus hijacking the cell and making it do bad things honestly it's both so the cells are definitely infected I do have to say that, of course, not every cell is going to be infected, right? And honestly, on therapy, most cells are uninfected. But at some point, they're exposed to this virus that they cannot get rid of. It's embedded in their DNA. And even if they're never infected, they can see from surrounding cells that things aren't right, right? They can see that there was an immune response at some point. And so they're reacting to that chronically. And so... HIV certainly hijacks the cell's um, systems to make more of itself. That's a trigger for eliciting an immune response. And then, of course, the infected cells are responding to the infection, as are the bystanders. But even with suppressive therapy, there's a memory. They know that there's a virus there, and they're trying to resolve it. And unfortunately, they can't. There's other situations in which you have... Um brain inflammation that has been associated with, you know, active, excessive activity. I think there's a story of, you know, steroids being used to treat neuropsychiatric disorders. Um, is this also maybe an avenue that can help? I mean, it's kind of weird because then you would be suppressing the immune system and you don't want that. But what kind of treatments do you think are possible for, for this issue? Yeah, Brenda, you're completely right. There were actually really promising studies about 10, 15 years ago looking at minocycline, which is a very common antibiotic to help reduce inflammation and protect the brain. And it worked really well in vitro and in vivo, and it moved all the way up to macaque studies, um, but it did not work in humans. Um, people have tried all kinds of anti-inflammatory agents like anti-CCL2, anti-neopterin, things like that. Um, and they just fall short in human translation and human application. Um, so ideally, we would find a way to suppress a common form of inflammation, right? That's upstream rather than one specific factor. I don't think that stopping one cytokine is going to fix anything. I think it's going to need to be a much more elegant approach. Um, but as of now, we don't have any one factor that, that seems to be working. Um, in my lab, we're actually looking at a different angle. We work on substance use, and we're looking now at cannabinoids, um, looking at those from the cannabis plant, uh, specifically either CBD or THC, and seeing how those may affect inflammation um, as the endocannabinoid system is very important in regulating inflammatory responses. And there is evidence that phytocannabinoids can be used to suppress inflammation in other viruses and other immune contexts. And so we're having those studies ongoing right now to see if it can help suppress inflammation. Um, and if so, this might be a really nice uh, model. So beyond cannabinoids, what else has your lab been studying in relation to this problem that we've kind of gone over? Yeah, cannabinoids are the main one for therapeutic potential. Um, but if we look more at the basic science of what's going on, we're doing some really cool studies. So we're looking at uh, therapies getting into the brain, right? Because we know that that's a major challenge. This virus can persist because of the blood-brain barrier that, that lets immune cells in, lets the virus in, but prevents therapies from getting in. And what we're finding out really interestingly are the mechanisms by which the blood-brain barrier elicits drug transporters and metabolizing enzymes to get these therapies in. And interestingly, we're finding that in the context of cocaine use, cocaine seems to mess this up. And so it prevents some therapies from getting in, and it seems to actually increase others from get, uh, getting into the brain. And so we're trying to figure out exactly why this is happening. We're also looking at uh, the brain macrophages and finding, again, interestingly, that cocaine seems to increase metabolism of some HP therapies, which means that you're going to have poor control of the virus because they're being excreted more rapidly. 
But then we find that in other people, the opposite happens. Um, and they may have toxicity from decreased metabolism. And we don't understand why this is happening and who's vulnerable. So right now we're doing um, a really big kind of transgenomic study to see what markers make people more vulnerable to responding or not responding to cocaine in this fashion. Yeah, I I, I guess that because, for example, some or drugs like cocaine, they do they get very quickly through the blood brain barrier? How do they access uh, the, the brain? Uh, what can we learn about it? The, how these drugs do it for, for our own therapeutic purposes. Yeah, cocaine is remarkable at getting in the brain. It happens incredibly quickly. We don't know the exact transporter, but it's believed to be a sodium uh, antiporter, but we don't know the exact one, but it gets in incredibly quickly. And by studying how things like cocaine get into the brain or immune cells get into the brain, we can leverage those mechanisms for therapies. So for instance, immune cells can get into the brain very easily because they have all the cognate receptors present on and at least at the blood barrier. So they have the same adhesion markers and tight junction proteins. Mm -hmm. And so for instance, let's say you can take a nanoparticle and code it with one of those. It may have an easier time of getting into the brain. Mm -hmm. My group isn't actively working on it, but we're interested in it. Um, and I know it's the focus of many research groups trying to find ways to mimic our natural systems. People are even looking at things um, coded in transferrin, to biotransferrin receptors, mm -hmm. or even things um, that are going to have glucose on them to help bind glucose transporters, any way to leverage things getting to the brain easier. The big challenge with HIV is that it doesn't infect the entire brain equally. It has mm -hmm. kind of so-called hotspots that it likes to infect. And so we're going to have to be very clever on where we're going to get these therapies, if we can get them in at all, but hopefully if we can. I mean, we got to get them to the right place at the right time um, and for the right person at the right dose. So it's a big challenge, but it's a really fun one that my group was having a really good time working on. Yeah. So when you think so, then I guess that if you could really uh, deliver antiretroviral retroviral drugs in a way that really they really make it to these hot spots in the brain, can you just, re I think you mentioned it, but just to be clear, uh, HIV will infect myeloid cells in the brain. Does it infect neurons too, or is it just the myeloid compartment in the brain? Good question. Um, people have looked extensively to our knowledge. We don't see evidence of neurons being infected. Mm -hmm. We see uh, myeloid cells, astrocytes are infected. Some groups have contention about this, but there is evidence that they are, mm -hmm. as well as pericytes comprising the blood-brain barrier. We don't see much for oligodendrocytes, but their functions are impacted, which is huge mm -hmm. for neuronal function. Um, and so many cells are infected. And again, even if they're uninfected, their whole biology has changed by this virus right. that shouldn't be there and the resulting immune responses to that virus. Do you think that some of the drug use that seems to go along with HIV may be a form of self-medication? Un unconscious, like it's helping fix things? That's a really good question. What I'll say is that there certainly is some substance use prior to acquiring HIV, right? And that's a factor. Um, some people either start or continue using substances after acquiring HIV. And as a whole, there is evidence that people use different substances as a form of self-medication for all kinds of purposes. So it would not be surprising if that were the case. Um, back to cannabinoids, it is very clear that they, that they help with things like pain. Um, there is neuropathy when you have HIV. And so that might be something that can help. Cannabinoids can help with mood. We have mood disorders. So it would not be unlikely or uncommon for that to, to, to occur. But I don't want to generalize broadly to all people because of course, um, that's not fair. Yeah. But yeah, I have to say, I never thought about all the implications of, uh, and, and, and reading, like looking at your work a little bit about you know, the, the, the impact that this has, uh, for, of course, on quality of life in ways that I, I wasn't aware of uh, and how important it is. Like, even if you're controlling viremia, you can still have all of these effects and that can still have a, a huge impact on your, on your cognitive function, your quality of life in general. Very, very interesting. Yeah, the cognitive factors are 
particularly interesting to me, right? Executive dysfunction is, I mean, it's key for all of our critical abilities to make decisions, um, abilities to maintain employment. If you don't remember to take your medications, that's going to be a really big problem for you, right? So it's not just keeping people alive with therapies. It's including, increasing their quality of life. Yeah, I think sometimes we just underestimate how important that is, not just keeping people alive, but, you know, uh, as, as, as good as possibly uh, one possibly can. That's that's very important. Um, so if I may just change, switch gears a little bit, uh, we don't often have uh, our guests, you know, in, in, in interesting transitions in career. I mean, our listeners really also like to know uh, the, the 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 what what are what are what the the guests of the show do and and how any advice on career and any career experience. So you just joined Emory uh, this year, so congratulations! It's been a couple of weeks. Um, I don't know if you would like, is there anything you would like to share? You know, maybe other people that are thinking of doing the transition. You were already uh, a prof uh, assistant professor at uh, Johns Hopkins, so it's not that. But I would say it's probably if you moved all the way to Georgia, it must be for a good reason. So would you like, would you like to share something about your, 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 your move and, and, and how um, your experience has been uh, so far in this, in this regard? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, I guess if I would start with that advice, I would tell people to be courageous and try new things. I had been at Hopkins since I was a postdoctoral fellow, so about nine years before I um, moved to Emory. And so it's a big change for me, which is scary. But I think <laughs> it's also really exciting because it's an opportunity to try out different projects and um, a new environment, have new collaborators have access to different patient populations, um, things of that nature. And I think it makes my science better by trying out new things. And so it took a little bit of courage to uh, think about switching and moving. I was very comfortable there. Uh, my family was there. But like I said, I think the opportunity to try new things, have new colleagues, um, be able to immerse myself in a different culture was really a good opportunity. And I'm really excited to be here. So when one undertakes a lab move, any advice to give to people? Yeah, I'm still going through it. My stuff is in storage. <laughs> we speak, <laughs> but renovations are almost finished. The biggest advice I'd say is organization, which can be a challenge. Um, but it, I found it's been really key, not only for things like samples, right? Making sure that you get rid of things you don't want anymore, things that are really old, but also organization of files and like timelines and making sure you're under you're aware of all of the university's policies, which is hard to know everything. But I think being organized has been a really big um, benefit in that. I've had some stumbling blocks, some things I didn't know I needed to do. And everyone's been very kind and gracious with me and reminding me if you forgot the step. But as a whole, um, it's really helped make it less stressful, just knowing what I'm supposed to do, knowing what's expected, and then just checking the boxes off. But it's a lot. And I say the other thing that um, was very important to me was that I didn't make this move lightly. I had nine people in the lab with me at the time. And it was a really big deal to consider moving because it is not just me and my family's life. It is all of their lives, whether they come with me or they stay. And so I thought a lot about how the move would impact them all personally. And I had plans for them if they decided to move, if they, if they decided to stay. And we had lots of conversations about it. And I left the choice up to them um, and presented what I thought were pluses and minuses for both situations. And so I think that was also really important, make sure that they they felt secure that I mentored them and support them no matter what they chose. Um, and yeah, things are going pretty good. So you got some of your team to move in with, to move, uh, with you? Pretty much everybody actually, nice. uh, which has been good really time. exceptional. I have a few people who were at career transitions, so they only had a few months in a lab left anyway, regardless of the move. And so I don't think it's fair to have them move their whole life for, you know, four months. Um, but we're still meeting virtually. They may come down for a little bit. I'm back every now and again in Maryland. And so we're in constant communication. Our uh, Williams Lab group 
chat is active. <laughs> in fact, I have eight messages now as we speak. So we're, <laughs> we're in constant communication. Um, but for the most part, everyone came. And it feels like a really big privilege that people decided to trust me with their lives. They uprooted their spouses, their children, you know, to believe in my desire to move somewhere else. And so I don't take it very lightly. And I'm very appreciative. That's very nice. That's, uh, that's, I think that's a good uh, note to wrap up our conversation. Uh, Jason, do you want to finish up uh, with the last question? Sure. So we, we always try to get a little behind the scientist here. So if you were not a scientist, what would you have been? I would have been in the performing arts in some way. So fun fact about me is that I went to a science high school for half of my uh, day. And I applied to both the science high school and a performing arts high school. And I got into the performing arts, but I chose to go science because I thought it was a more practical career outcome with better career safety. Um, maybe I'd be on Broadway or I'd be, you know, in movies or a musician or singing, but uh, I almost chose to go into performing arts high school. Well, sorry, Hollywood, you just missed out. That's too bad. Sorry, Broadway. That's 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 how it is. But well, I think we're all very happy that you that you that you're joining us. And do you do some some performing arts on the side? Do you have like a theater group or something like that? I actually don't. I just do it now for fun. Um, so I like to try random instruments out and learn them. Um, always singing, always music going on. Um, always dancing. And so it's a big part of my culture, but also just part of my everyday life. In fact, the lab, we often have music. Um, we do karaoke a lot. And so that's kind of my way to perform, I guess, and kind Love of it. feel that side of me. We can find out from them if they think I'm a good singer or not, but uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. <laughs> what are they going to say? Of course. Oh, yes, yeah, she's great. She's great. <laughs> she's, she just pays for all the drinks. So we're good. We are definitely going. That's good that you have a captive, but you know, the definition of a captive audience, that's perfect. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. Well, and good luck with the new beginnings. Thank you so much. That brings us to the end of our show. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.immunologypodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all of the interview and round of papers. You can also reach out to us on X at Immunopodcast or via email at info at immunologypodcast.com with feedback or to suggest a guest. See you next time.